Naomi stream. Absolutely. We are, we are here. We are queer. How did canvassing go? Did you get to get out? And yeah, canvass? I did end up getting to go canvas a little bit. Uh, I was canvassing with Matt Bender. We had one really good conversation with this older couple. Other than that, a couple no shows on the doors a couple times where it's like somebody really not interested or they're like, uh, my dad's voting for Latimer. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> that was oh, probably yeah. one of the, the funniest interactions. <laughs> I think that the the one older couple we talked to, we, we made Bowman supporters out of them by the end of the convo. What were like some of the major points in the conversation? Yeah, so one of the things that like they were really big on was like they had just very much kind of an anti-Trump sentiment in general. They had seen like all of the George Latimer ads that were running three ads every commercial break like in that district. It was crazy the amount of ads that people were inundated in. One of the big things that was like pulling them away from Bowman was the fire alarm incident like that was that was the thing they kind of cited mm -hmm. and um we were just really able to have like a, a really like inquisitive conversation talking about like yeah totally with you on like the anti-trump sentiment like what's really interesting to me is like all of this trump donor money like 20 million plus dollars has been funneling into george latimer's campaign i mean i'm sure you've seen his ads everywhere why is it that like trump donors like prefer this guy over bowman by like a long shot lead them to make their own conclusions and that that's how you really get them to to change their mind on something nice well good job in that convo yeah i think it went um, really well it was, it was really good a really good experience also talking with people who are like actually kind of normal when it comes to politics because I know that like in these online spheres like the kind of people we talk to like are decidedly usually not normal at all. <laughs> yeah that's something that one of the reasons I was so excited to go out in Canvas is I'm like I miss talking to day-to-day -day people. It's just refreshing and it feels I don't know for me a little bit more sincere in some ways too well, so yeah, I, mean, I it's, really it's enjoy to have a, a conversation with a real person who's not calling you a groomer every like five minutes oh my gosh yeah <laughs> <Right>? i imagine <laughs> like oh no 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 yeah uh, yeah you deal with the really absurd yeah it's stuff. like it's like it's great to like actually talk to someone instead of them just being like you're poisoning your baby with the, with the transgender milk <laughs> speaking of which i i wanted to go into how did so where did you start on the internet? And that pulls us over to mm -hmm. how you, I, I'm pretty sure you had a moment of going viral, right? Yeah. Do you wanna like tell us your story on that? Yeah, totally. So it all started when I had met my husband, uh, they're genderqueer and like, they had already had some kids from a previous marriage. And so, you know, when, when we were getting married, I was stepping into like a, a stepmother role in that relationship. Um, and they had one child, their youngest, who was still, like, being bottle-fed. And, mm -hmm. um, like, this was an opportunity where, like, I could actually induce lactation as a trans woman and feed this baby, which was something that I was, like, really interested in as a part of motherhood. And so I ended up talking to my doctors, ended up, um, like, you know, pulling a bunch of research, of, like, all the case studies we've done on lactation and trans women, um, get, some, get some medicine prescribed, basically just... It's it lactation is entirely a hormonal process. So essentially, you just need to add prolactin in order, like in addition to your other HRT regimen, and you can induce lactation just the same way that that other cis women would induce lactation, like how lesbians or other like adoptive parents have been doing for years. It worked. It was really cool. It was an amazing experience. And uh, I guess the mistake was talking about that with my audience on TikTok. It was like a really wholesome little clip. I talked about how you know, I was going through this experience. How it was really amazing, magical, just like really wholesome family moment and like really like affirming to be able to like really step into that role of motherhood in such a like i mean physical biological way as a trans woman which is like something that people try to gatekeep from us so hard yeah. and um that clip ended up going viral on like conservative outlets and um mostly it was trending over on like x.com uh and yeah. the death threats news articles like crazy things that people made up about me were absolutely unhinged and yeah it just kind of blew up from there <laughs> that's the story how do you navigate something like that i imagine that was like a i would have struggled during that time yeah was that it, was, it was how did you feel about it it was kind of surreal because it was a like there was a solid like week or two where if i would like refresh my notifications on twitter like it would just be literally flooded every time i refreshed it was crazy um, and so I was just trying to engage like as best as I could, um, mm -hmm. like, you know, talking about, excuse me, oh my gosh, like I've been working with my doctor, uh, I compiled a little research document about all of the peer reviewed literature we had on lactation and trans women, 
um, all like the medicines involved in HRT, you know, providing assurance, like literally the, the National Library of Medicine says that all of these medicines are okay to take while lactating. And like this has been done safely, effectively, uh, nutritional contents are just the same. All the research we had on that, and I even actually got my own breast milk tested by sending it to a lab, uh, analyzing like the nutrients and stuff, and everything came back perfectly in the clear. Big surprise. And um, yeah, I was just trying to engage as best as I could and then recognize that like there is going to be so many people that engage with that discourse that there's nothing I could say to them. They're just too yeah. like like brain poisoned about trans people. But for people that are coming into it genuinely curious and, and you know, maybe they have some kind of like preconceived bias one way or the other, but hopefully seeing like, you know, that I'm approaching it from a very scientific informational perspective, like... I think that's the best I can do. And that's, and that's all I did. I can't even imagine dealing with the waves of that. Did you get like some positivity out of it too? Cause I imagine when you go so viral imagine like that, go... I don't know if it's in the right wing circles, I feel like the vast majority of it's going to be hate, but did you get people showing up to support you and, and on top of that, or was it primarily just dealing with really horrible people? Yeah, there was definitely a mix of both. I actually uh, gained quite a like, quite a few oomphies with some like pretty prominent trans people over on those faces. And I had a lot of people reaching out, you know, offering sympathy and support and like concern about safety. And uh, it was it was really nice to have like kind of that community come back and like try to make sure I was doing okay. And it was it was really nice to see like, I had quite a bit of support um, coming into my inbox from bigger trans people, also just like random people that were like, you know, seeing you fighting your fight out there was like really inspiring. And um, yeah, it was nice to have those moments throughout it all that really helped me get through it. That's really good to hear. I have a silly question. What is an oomphy? Oh, oomphy is like a like a mutual. It's a I, I'm, oh, okay. I, I'm like a lingo autist. So like, I love little terms for things that are that are funny or cute or quirky. And so yeah, mutual mutuals are oomphies. <laughs> Oomphies, that's cute. Where? <laughs> that's that's true. I've never heard it. It's very very cute. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, drinking my sodies, talking about oomphies. What what were you doing on social media before? Did did going viral shift what you do? Did you turn more into like? I see you do a lot of like um, I'd say kind of educational content, but mm -hmm. I guess you're really like a debate sis, right? Kind of both. Yeah, I I had been doing like a mix. I got my my start on TikTok. Um, at the very beginning, I was actually kind of making just like transgender shit post content on TikTok. And then, uh, cause I was into like politics and, and big scientist myself, I'm a PhD candidate. Um, so started talking about like, you know, some more like rhetorical stuff about being trans and like fighting for trans rights. And, um, then I got into like the TikTok live debate sphere where you can just like have people like cycling in and out of like requesting to join your live, debating them. And that's kind of where I like really blew up was in like the TikTok live mm. debate sphere. From there, I kind of started doing some transitional stuff over on YouTube and Twitch. Because uh, I feel like those platforms are a lot more sustainable in the long term. Like one of the, the really challenging things about TikTok is like if you're not just constantly trending, it's really hard to make it on TikTok. It was kind of like a lot of pressure, especially like pressure to feed into the algorithm, which can be so unpredictable and can also like push you in directions that you don't necessarily want to go. Um, yeah. But I felt a lot more freedom with kind of the Twitch and YouTube and like, you know, sometimes videos will do a lot worse than I expect. Sometimes they'll do a lot better than I expect. And that's kind of okay. That's kind of okay. I feel like YouTube has been a lot better in the long term, especially like you get a lot of engagement even on old videos on YouTube, uh, which is just not mm. the case at all on, on TikTok. You came into this, so going back to like um, what happened when you went viral, you came into this relationship or or I guess like the whole breastfeeding story, mm -hmm. like you came into this relationship already out as a trans woman. Yeah. <laughs> when, like how long had you been out, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so I have been transitioning for like three and a half years now. Um, I started doing TikTok stuff. It was probably only like six months into transition. Um, I was one of those trans girls that like, I transitioned super freaking hard, super fast. Like, mm. my body was just like, okay, new hormones, let's freaking go. Um, <laughs> nice. and yeah, I had, I had a pretty interesting experience with like, I was like male failing after like two and a half months on hormones. And so I kind of had to just like, completely switch over like really fast with like my my own transition and um yeah and, and I think that also like having just like that experience of like diving straight into the deep end like 
made me really want to have the ability to like talk about that and share that with other people, especially other trans people. And um, TikTok seemed kind of like the the most appropriate space to like kind of get discovered, to create an audience, that stuff. And yeah, that's kind of how I ended up there. Um, one of my chatters is wondering, what's male failing? Oh, male failing is is referring to like when you're a trans woman and you're trying to like present as a guy or whatever, but people like see you as a woman. Like for example, I was wearing like my old hoodies that I had like back when I was a guy or whatever. And I went to this like pharmacy in a rural town picking up some medicine for a friend at the time. And uh, the cashier was like, oh yeah, you're, ex excuse me, ma'am, like you're next. And I was like, I was not expecting it at all. Um, <laughs> Because I thought that, like, people were still seeing me as a guy or whatever, and <laughs> so... That's probably an interesting, like, experience to go through. Yeah, it really is. It really is. <laughs> what are your thoughts? So today is Sinful Sunday for us over here. We normally talk about spirituality, religion, the whatnot. Yeah. I'm curious, what's your perspective on religion, spirituality? Are you religious, spiritual, or just strictly atheist, not involved in either of those? I've got an interesting perspective on that because I was raised in like a, a pretty, uh, like, conservative religious household. And so, you know, throughout like, from my childhood and my, my teenage years, I was definitely identifying as a Christian. I had that kind of deconstruction around the same time that I, I came to understand myself as trans. It's actually really interesting. I, I came to understand myself as trans first, and then a lot of the deconstruction stuff happened after that. Um, and like a really big factor was just like seeing how poorly like my old Christian communities and other Christian communities were treating me. Um, and like that there was no way to like reach them, um, even from like, the most kind of like trans affirming interpretations of Christianity, like just the hatred and vitriol that I encountered was another kind of pretty big motivating factor in my deconversion. At the same time, I was also like exploring a lot more like atheist or um, like skeptic content. And um, a lot of it was just like so much stuff about like religion because of how indoctrinated and like normalized it all was growing up. Like I didn't even think to like consider all these questions or like, the, the, the kind of like thought terminating cliches that you internalize so hard if you're having doubts then like that's a show that your faith is weak and like that that's bad and mm. just the ways that they teach you not to think about it not to question anything also like i had so little self-awareness before my transition because i was like so like repressed out of my own body and my, my brain and my feelings that like it was really really crazy to like come into this experience of being of like becoming a person and questioning all these things that i had taught been taught and really like actually forging an identity for myself for the first time. Nowadays, I, I identify more as like an agnostic. Like I don't have any kind of like positive or negative claim about religion. I think that there's lots of ways that religion helps people very much. Um, like especially from the like the philosophy of like a third place or a third space, like in addition to, you know, your work, your home, having that kind of community space, like the church is that for so many people. And also not necessarily just, you know, Christian churches, but there's like, a bunch of other communities like that, like Unitarian Universalists or Pagans or, you know, if, if you're not, if you're not of the Christian flavor, there's a lot of other ways that people do this. And um, I've also kind of learned more about like spirituality and, and people using it more so as like a tool for self-exploration and self-discovery, kind of like a way of performing like therapy on yourself. And I think that's really cool. But it's not something that's like ever resonated with me too hard, but I, I really like understanding like what other people get out of it, you know? That's what I use spirituality for. Mm -hmm. um, and I yeah. haven't heard anyone who's not into it articulate it so well. So that's just very <laughs> impressive. Oh, well, thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah, I actually had some friends that like, it, it was a bunch of other like uh, trans femme TikTokers that I had met. There was this, this server we all created and um, like a lot of them were like into tarot and other stuff like that. And, you know, me being like a very much kind of like in the skeptic side of things this time is like, okay, you know, like, explain it to me, like, I'm a total skeptic atheist, like, like, what's what's good about Tara? Like, what do you get out of this? And mm -hmm. this really cool, like non binary person was able to articulate it like, like that so well that I was like, I get it. Like, that's amazing. Like the idea that like, your subconscious always has like the things that you know, you need to be doing the note that you know, you need to be addressing on your mind. And then like, tarot or other other forms of spirituality like this are a way of really like bringing that to the forefront of your mind and like starting to create that narrative that like really helps you like move on process uh and like build yourself up from there so you ended up leaving your religion right what, yeah i did mm -hmm. what was how did you feel about that what was some of the like obviously the positives are you know not being tethered to people who are 
attacking you, right? Yeah, and like but I can I can make the most out of the, the, the one life that I know I do negatives. have. <laughs> yes, yeah. So the yeah, I definitely hear you on that. Um, is the main positive that you see from churches and the whatnot being that community space? Because that's mainly what I've seen as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think so. And so like, when it comes to like, not being welcome into a community like that anymore, because say you're queer, or, you know, you're ostracized for some other reason, I think that losing out on that primary benefit of religion, like, it just becomes so bad for people and like so harmful because you, you, you end up carrying all of like the internalized guilt and shame and like, really bad thought patterns, but you don't get any of that community anymore. And like, yeah, it just becomes a really harmful force in, 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 at least it did in my life. So obviously you've been kind of fighting this war on trans mm -hmm. people that's been really ramping up. Yeah, the, the up. war on transgenderism, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the war on transgenderism. God gives the most difficult challenges to his strongest soldiers. To his and strongest I... transgenders, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and you really took that up. You go hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what are some of the like policies specifically that are unfolding that you are most concerned about personally? Yeah, I mean, on like a policy perspective, just the the backsliding of all of the protections that trans people have had, like the banning of gender affirming care, um, both for adults and minors at this point, like really government influencing with that kind of doctor patient relationship is is horrible, in my opinion. Like, mm -hmm. the thing is, like, with any kind of bill where you're trying to like restrict access to certain types of healthcare, you're going to be creating some kind of like one size fits all approach when I don't think you can really do that with any type of medicine. Like I'm a strong believer in like the individualized doctor patient relationship and what might be right for one trans person at a certain age is probably wrong for a different trans person at a different age. And mm -hmm. that's really up to, you know, that person, their doctor, and their parents if they're a minor, and, and just trying to get in the way of that, like, it just makes medicine worse, and it just makes doctors have to worry about, like, oh, am I going to, you know, now have to worry about, like, being arrested for doing something slightly wrong uh, under this, like, perceived, you know, conservative law or whatever, and things constantly changing, and, like, it makes doctors less able to provide good care, it makes them have to worry about so much more stuff, and then it just really, like, messes up anybody who doesn't fit the exact kind of mold that a conservative wants you to, which is don't transition ever. I mean, that's that's like their end goal. There are quite a bit of like overlaps in that and the the fear that doctors have with abortions, right? As they mm -hmm. go and they restrict abortions, people being scared of get um, providing abortions for people who may need them. Yeah, like, I actually need them really badly. Yeah, I saw this really interesting study that came out of Texas after like the it was the six week abortion ban, where there was like dozens of cases of women who they had like ectopic pregnancies or other situations where like, literally the woman's life was in danger because of something going wrong with pregnancy. And they weren't able to do this abortion that would that would be life-saving until it was like too late that it caused a bunch of unnecessary damage, like permanent damage to fertility or organs. Like there was there was at least a dozen cases of women like losing fertility because they couldn't have gotten an abortion sooner, um, based off of what their doctors recommended versus what the bill allowed for. And like mm. that's just so messed up that like they're literally permanently ruining these women's chance at having a baby because they don't know enough about medicine to write a law that can allow for like these life saving scenarios and i even beyond that just like knowing that the doctors and the patients in that relationship knows what's best for them it's really dark out there right now did you identify within like the queer labels before your transition or no not at all uh which which is really funny because i had this like kind of interesting kinship with queer people where like i mean literally my entire friend group growing up was super freaking queer and it's like i was kind of like the token I mean, straight white guy at the time, and it didn't really make like a lot of sense. Uh, but then in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> How did like you end up realizing, hey, I'm trans? Like, what did that process look like for you? Oh, gosh, it was it was actually interestingly kind of a slow process. Um, I mean, a lot of it was like, 
becoming aware of all of, like, the trans stuff that I've been repressing for so long, like, I can remember, like, as, as young as I have, like, memory of, like, having kind of an awareness of gender, like, wishing that I was a girl, wishing that I'd been born a girl, like, wishing that I would get to, like, grow up to be a woman, um, all that kind of jazz, and then I never really thought of that as, like, a transgender experience, because I didn't really know what the experience of trans people was like, other than maybe, like, you know, one or two media stories of, like, oh, somebody feels like they were trapped in the wrong body, but I never really felt, like, trapped in my body, it just felt like I was entirely, like, distant from my body, like, I had no attachment to it, and so it was kind of like, the, it felt like the opposite of being trapped in my body, it was like, I had dissociated so hard away from my body that how could I feel trapped in it? My only other experience with, like, trans people was a lot of the, like, horrible stuff that my parents would say, uh, being conservative and transphobic and homophobic about anything queer, and so I never really thought that that's something that, like, would have been an option available to me, um, until, like, let's see, it was probably, yeah, it was towards the end of my undergrad, um, when I started reading more about, like, the experiences of trans people, and I was like, oh no, this all sounds way too familiar, um, and so yeah. I started to, like, experiment with, okay, well, you know what, Let's just explore things. Let's just see what feels good. You know, maybe I just want to try like wearing some feminine clothes, being a femboy or whatever, you know, maybe even going out in feminine clothes. And so I did a lot of experimentation, um, you know, thrifting for whatever piece I could find and just like trying, seeing what feels good, what works. Um, and pretty quickly I realized that like when I was going out and presenting femme, it was like, yeah, I just want people to like call me a girl and like see me as a woman and all, all that stuff and at the same time I started researching okay so like what 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 would HRT do to me like what what what's the what's all this estrogen stuff about and uh did a very deep dive on like all the effects of estrogen I was like okay so like where's the bad part like this all sounds like exactly what I want and um within like a month or two of that I had an appointment with Planned Parenthood got some uh, informed consent HRT and never looked back since. It's been, it's been amazing. Like I would fantasize hard at night about like transforming into a girl by via whatever means I could think about. Maybe it was some kind of like fantasy magic. Maybe it was some kind of like, you know, medical thing that's been discovered. But yeah, that was like the constant fantasies playing in my head like at night when I was trying to go to sleep. Your like experience of feeling not necessarily trapped in your body, but kind of disconnected. Mm -hmm. I also really went through that for a while. And then so I, I didn't go on um, any hormones, mm -hmm. but I ended up getting a gender affirming um, surgery. Oh, and yeah. I found it was a lot easier to connect with my body afterwards. They told me, you know, like, you're gonna go home and you're gonna nap afterwards, <laughs> you're gonna be so tired. And then we need you please get up, walk, you know, you need to do that to not have blood clots in your legs and mm -hmm. stuff. And then you need to go to bed early. You're going to be exhausted. That'll be easy. And that mm -hmm. was not what happened. <laughs> I wanted to rock climb immediately. I oh felt gosh. so like I was, <laughs> I was thrilled yeah, and I didn't go wonderful. to bed until late. Um, I found it was a lot easier to connect with my body and I've enjoyed certain things like yoga, for example, a lot more since that. Have you had a similar experience? What has that like, have you found ways to reconnect with your body? Has that come very naturally? That's a really great question. I think that some ways have definitely come kind of naturally. Uh, and a lot of other ways were very much just kind of like something that I needed to build up over time. Because a lot of it was like, I never had experience like actually feeling and processing my emotions. Like, because mm -hmm. of how like repressed and distant from my body I was, like, so much of my life was just like pretending that like emotions didn't exist and uh not being able to experience them and a lot of the beginning times of transition it was just very shocking it was being like whoa i can like actually feel these things and like i can actually cry and it was it was really really wild but then a lot of it has been like just kind of taking things one step at a time and like doing what feels good um and a lot of exploration i know that like a lot of people talk about transition, especially like medical transition is like going through a second puberty. And it absolutely is like you're gonna do cringy shit when you're especially yeah. early on in transition. 
And it's like that awkward teenage phase. You know, everybody has their awkward teenage phase where they do cringy shit. You're just a late bloomer and that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> you also seem to have the weird. So my first experience with trans, like hearing about mm -hmm. trans people was also negative from mm -hmm. a friend who got mad at me um, because I did like a day of silence with tape over my mouth as a part of supporting mm. the LGBTQ community because I found out homophobia exists because I didn't come out and then I got like a, par a, a partner to go to semi-formal with me and everyone was being homophobic. And I was like, what the Damn. heck? Yeah, um, why, why, why people gotta be homophobic? Like who, who invented uh, this homophobia stuff? I'd like to have a word with them. Right, fucked up, very <laughs> weird. <laughs> like, but also I had a friend come back and be like, you know, what the heck? you're supporting trans people trans people are ripping my family apart mm -hmm. you know her sister had just come out as her sister mm -hmm. and you know her, that was my first running into like trans people as oh. a concept but you dealt with that within your family it sounds mm -hmm. like some of my earliest experiences like hearing my parents talk about trans people happened because my sister my little sister had a trans friend in high school and I can remember the exact words that my parents said was that trans people are abominations just doing it for attention. Um, and so, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to not seek any attention at all. And I tried to hide my transition from my parents for about like six months, um, having like the need to come out to them, like really looming over my head. Um, and eventually, like, I just wrote them a letter explaining like, yeah, I'm trans, justifying like it's okay to be trans and like you don't even have to be transphobic like it, it can be completely compatible with your religion um just like doing my best to like make the appeal i can on every front like meeting them where they're at and uh mm -hmm. the response that i got from them initially was hours of silence even though i know they read it immediately mm -hmm. um and then at the time they actually reached out to my older brother uh who ended up like driving down to see them and like explain some things to them and it was an okay conversation. At that point, they had kind of like been to a point where like, okay, we're gonna like tolerate this transition stuff. We're gonna like, you know, see what's up and just try to feel it out a little bit. And so I was hopeful, but also very scared. Um, and things kind of remained in this weird, awkward, like tolerating, but not approving stage uh, where I could tell that like the way that my parents were treating me to my face was very different than the way that they were treating me behind my back. Um, oh. And just over this past Christmas, actually, um, I ended up being like fully disowned by my mom. And then um, things have been a little bit more complicated with my dad since then. Um, but yeah, that kind of coincided with like me taking a break from streaming stuff, like kind of had a, a pretty decent depressive episode around that time. And yeah. um, but now I feel like I'm really coming out of it. And that's that's really good for me. <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear that you're coming out of it. I'm sorry that they have been so awful yeah it was um, it was really awful that's <laughs> that's a way to put it <laughs> it'd be about uh, uh you said you were out for three and a half ish years by the time you found your partner how long have you been out now then oh three and a half years is like right now i met my oh, okay. partner me. like two years into transition Okay. Um, yeah, and then we've been together ever since then. I mean, it's tough, especially if religion is a strong motivator for mm -hmm. this, but I'm wishing you the best on that. I hope it, I hope, I hope yeah. your parents pull through. Uh-huh. No, things are, things are kind of complicated with my dad. Uh, we ended up meeting, it was a couple months ago, where he gave me a pretty genuine apology and Aww. kind of expressed that, like, you know, he wants to have me in his life in whatever capacity we can. Um, things have been kind of awkward and difficult and we haven't really been able to see each other, uh, since then, but I'm at a point with my dad where, like, I can talk to him about things and we're probably going to see each other at least a couple times a year. Um, and then where things are at with my mom is I, I've, I've given her, like, an open invitation that if she wants to talk to me again, she's welcome to, like, send me an apology and... Other than that, I don't want to speak to her. That's very fair. Yeah. I know I had a whole time I had to cut off from my mom because it's mm -hmm. like straight up calling me it oh. because I'm non-binary when she could have used my name. And I'm like, we got to stop doing this, babe. Yikes. Yeah. Like, we've got boundaries we have. And hopefully, hopefully your mother realizes having you in your, her life is more important than this bullshit these yeah, bullshit I, I hope ideas. so. I hope like, so. But um, their their brains kind of got, especially my mom's brain, kind of got broken even further over like 
pandemic and like sitting with the Fox oh. News news cycle throughout no, the entire time not and the ugh. Like, she's the kind of person that, like, will watch Fox News and get angry at the TV. And, like, I do not understand how people can torture themselves like that. The first time I saw Fox News, I unironically thought it was just, like, I I did not think it was supposed to be real news. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, it's and that, like... was, that was even without audio because I was at a YMCA at the time with oh, one gosh. of my clients. <laughs> And I was watching, I'm looking up and I'm like, you know, how they have the muted TVs mm -hmm. and the gyms. I'm like, what is this? Yeah, al alternative facts, alternative reality. Yeah. Oh, it's really, <laughs> really rough. But it it's sounds crazy. like so your brother showed up to try to like explain and mm -hmm. be, it sounds like you had a supportive sibling. Yeah, my siblings, both my little sister and my older brother have been incredibly supportive and understanding throughout the entire process and like I'm just really close with both of them and it's been really nice to still have that family in my life and then also like mm -hmm. establishing my own family with my children and having them you know be like aunts and uncles to my kids and like getting to have this this queer family um has been a really good way of like being like you know even if I can't have the family I wanted with my parents like I can make this beautiful loving queer family you know with my siblings with my kids with my wife and it's been nice be to be able to like do something to like like repair that kind of generational trauma you know no absolutely absolutely the chosen family and yeah. and the family that does show up for you is just i found it to be huge mm -hmm. earlier you mentioned talking about gender affirming surgery i actually mm -hmm. have a consultation for an orchiectomy next week and um honestly i'm the kind of person like i've been terrified of medical stuff my entire life we can get into that a little bit that's an interesting one because my parents were anti-vaxxers too so mm. i ended up getting all my vaccines as an adult um being like terrified of doctors and needles and vaccines and everything the entire time because like i just wasn't around doctors growing up um and so you like knowing that i really want to get an orchiectomy gotta gotta win no nut november you know uh <laughs> <laughs> for sure for sure uh-huh but like knowing that this is something i really want but also still dealing with like that really bad medical anxiety has been an interesting mm. experience and i wanted to talk to you about like how was your experience with like medical anxiety and gender affirming surgery and like oh, what would you recommend a... for somebody who's kind of in my place is orky orku can you say it again and tell me what it yeah orchiectomy is where they remove the testicles so okay yeah do it or no balls well, actually do it and no balls <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So for me, um, I think I had some weird additional pressures that I didn't realize um, mm -hmm. because I could not have afforded it if not for my community fundraising with oh, me. Oh, that's um, nice. And the main place I came out was I came out like almost I came out to a couple people in my real like I don't want to say real life because the Internet's been such a key part of my life for a long time. Um, but in offline space, right? Mm -hmm. So my main space that I was out was actually my chat. And oh, that okay. was where I found, yeah, well, being in Indiana, I was like, anyone I came out to, I had to explain what non-binary was. It was like, mm. before a lot of people knew what non-binary was, in the vast majority of people I came out to, I had to like, explain the basics yeah um, you were like one of the pioneers of non-binaryism back when non-binaries were invented in what was it like 2020 or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I actually co-invented being really? non-binary by the way <laughs> no but but um my i was lucky in my chat actually I feel like really helped me have that first like affirming space and oh, I really really wonderful. appreciated that yeah. Unfortunately, um, I felt like I had a lot of nervousness because I I knew I was non-binary, right? But I wondered, like, what if I'm wrong about this? What if, mm. like, I'm just completely wrong? Because I rose, you know, we we got the funds raised and I was like, okay, I'm set to do this. And I started getting really nervous and having, like, nightmares. I'd have these oh, nightmares gosh. where I'd wake up. And I'd be missing, yes, my titties, but also an arm. Like, oh, <laughs> like what the hell? What kind of gender-affirming surgery is that? 
<laughs> I know. It's like your gender also requires a one less arm. <laughs> like, goddamn. <laughs> um, but I was I and I struggled with that all the way up until the surgery because I mm. felt I didn't really have anyone to talk to. I think mm. one of the biggest things would have been to have someone to air my concerns with so that I wouldn't feel so alone going through the process because I felt like I owed it to my community to be sure about this and, mm. uh, you know, for it to be a good thing because of, you know, they put the funds towards it. And I was like, oh, fuck. And then, um, yeah, that's a lot of pressure. And then I was really, yeah, I was really scared to go in, but I, I was terrified day of terrified, okay. <laughs> but I went in and, you know, the woman that put me under was hilarious. She's like, <laughs> she was, she was just cracking me up, making so many jokes about drugs. I was like, oh my, oh my God, I love her. She's like, I'm putting you <laughs> under. I'm like, okay. And they put me under and I woke up. I had both of my arms. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I was so excited about that. And I also realized uh, my chest seemed significantly smaller. Hmm. Um, and I really did. I just felt amazing after the fact. Like I felt really, really happy. I think I'm very lucky in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, every step of the process, because it was like, you know, there was the nervousness of waking up and feeling like things were wrong or not feeling okay. And I was just loopy as hell. There's this photo. <laughs> I don't know if I ever posted it, but there's this photo my sister took when she came to pick me up of me in a wheelchair. And I'm like peace signing with the goofiest, most fucked up drugged face ever. Yeah. Like I'm so happy though. <laughs> like we we love the post anesthesia feeling all <laughs> yeah. goopy. I the only one time I've gone under for anesthesia is when I had my wisdom teeth taken out. And I was mm. I was terrified of even that surgery because I'm such a little anxious mess when it comes to doctors. Uh, and I remember like waking up from that. I actually had it done at the same time as my little sister. We got our, our wisdom teeth taken out together. So like, we were both kind of coming to around the same point. And I remember like being all like giddy and laughing and silly and like kind of stumbling over myself. And like I, I remember what I really wanted was my sister to tell me a joke. But like apparently I couldn't see her yet because she was still waking up. And so I said that she was a bitch. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> entertain me or else yeah <laughs> oh that's so cute though um what are you so are you just nervous about the surgery itself yeah i mean i definitely don't do very well with pain in general mm -hmm. um and so like i'm terrified about recovery i'm terrified about like you know i mean complications are possible they're not very likely with an orky like orky is actually one of the most simple procedures when it comes to gender affirming surgery um, you know, just terrified of like things really like hurting down there and aching for a long time. And I haven't ever looked into orkies. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had a pretty significant amount of tissue taken from my breasts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did not experience a lot of lethargy. I couldn't lift my arms over my head. And that was really, really hard for me mm -hmm. because I wanted to do a lot of things, right? The first thing I want to do when I got out was rock climb. Yeah, um, because I was like, I feel like I could just climb a mountain right now. Easy. No problem. I'm mm. feeling fantastic. So hopefully you have that like rush of um, excitement, but I don't know how it'll be. I know I had to wear like a ba like a, a kind of binding bra for a while. Mm -hmm. And I was nervous, like, how am I going to feel when I take it off? Like, mm, I haven't seen anything yeah. under it for a while. Um, and then also, I'm praying for you on the, like, difficulties of showers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, from, yeah. What I've, from what I've read, it, it's kind of like, at least for the first, like, week or so, like, you kind of have to, like, just let water run over it and, like, hope the pain is not too bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm wishing you the best on that. Good luck with your surgery. And I know for yeah. me, I don't even now mine might be i have a feeling is very very different mm -hmm. completely different parts of the body but for what it's worth like i don't know how much how long ago it was it's a few years at this point probably mm -hmm. and i don't remember the pain it was just remembering the excitement and the joy mm -hmm. and uh feeling so much more connected with my body so i hope that does end up being your experience but 
Yeah, no, and, and Hoping like, and wishing for all you. things considered, I think the Orky's supposed to be a, actually a pretty simple recovery. Like, you're supposed to be up and moving again within, like, three days, and then within, like, a couple nice. weeks, you can kind of return to, like, normal activities. Um, and then within, like, a couple months, everything should be healed over. So, in, in terms of surgery, that's actually a pretty simple one, but... <laughs> how do you feel about going, like, after coming back canvassing for Bowman, by the way? How mm -hmm. did you feel about that? Like, I'm really glad I went. I mean... I know that, thought? you know, Bowman didn't win his primary, but um, I think that, and this is something that I've talked about, like, one of the best benefits of canvassing is even if you don't, you know, win win the race or whatever, like, what it does for you yourself mentally is incredible. Like, going out there, doing something, like, it does so much for your brain and your mental health that it's it's really hard to quantify like the the benefits mm -hmm. of touching grass and all that stuff and mm -hmm. being able to meet other content creators like as co-workers um it was really awesome being in that space because being a content creator can be really isolating at times you know i i know like people having like big audiences is like there's always a lot of people there but you know talking with other people who like do the same kind of thing their experiences and like having that kind of more co-worker relationship is it, it can be really hard to find in these spaces and that, and that was really nice mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. yeah and then i also just had a really good time in new york a uh, little bit of tea to drop i met this really cute girl the last night in new york and we're talking what? about things and it's going really really well Aww, <laughs> yeah my congrats. partner and i are Polly, so we're exploring things and um yeah, it's been it's been really amazing. <laughs> That's fantastic. Man, you were some people's nightmare. Like <laughs> raising kiddos as a poly trans person. Yeah, like... I know. Like the 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 queer family talking about like the triad polycule with three transgenders, like <laughs> When navigating like kiddos and their friends specifically, do you have to deal with things around that or has that been pretty smooth sailing overall? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. It's been kind of interesting because um, like our, our kids very much have like two homes at the same time because you know, their relationship with their bio dad is very different than their relationship with me and um, my partner. And so it's kind of like... <laughs> What's really crazy is that Biodad is like very devoutly Catholic. And so they have mm. like this super Catholic space that they live in and then also like this super queer space with us. And so they're gonna they're gonna grow up and, and have some real interesting dissonance there. Uh, but I also think that just like normalizing like these really queer relationships and you know, we have lots of queer friends in our lives, like is going to give them a lot of perspective that's going to help them see like where the harms of the church are and you know maybe mm -hmm. they they still grow up religious but I, I think they'll be well better adjusted than a lot of the religious people that grow up like having queer people like exclusively demonized or like they yeah. pretend that the queer people don't exist like yeah just them having this perspective I, I think it's done a lot for them but also created a lot of like interesting like tensions with the religious side of their family where like they're not being cool about like their moms that they love very much and uh, that's been hard on them and, and we're just trying to do like the best we can for them. Well, thank you for so much for being out here, talking yeah. about the things you talk about, mm -hmm. showing up to Canvas. Ooh. It was a joy meeting you. Thank you for taking the time to like show up and chat a little bit. Yeah, it's it's been very fun, very fun.